Welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today, I'm very excited to have Lori Gottlieb on the podcast. Gottlieb is a psychotherapist and New York Times bestselling author of Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, which is currently being adapted as a television series with Eva Longoria. I think that's how you pronounce her name. In addition to her clinical practice, she writes the Atlantic's weekly Dear Therapist advice column and contributes regularly to the New York Times and many other publications. She's also a sought-after expert in media, such as the Today Show, Good Morning America, the CBS Early Show, CNN, and NPR's Fresh Air. Lori, this is amazing to talk to you today. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. I don't think I've ever opened up the podcast by saying amazing talking to you today. I was just saying nice chatting with you today, you know, so this is, I really mean it. I really mean it. Um, Your book is terrific. It is, um, I finished it uh, last night, finally finished it last night. I've been like chipping away at it for like a while because life keeps getting in the way. So um, how you wrapped everything up, I was in tears and I can't imagine like, how someone could be human and read your book and not be in tears by the by the end of your book. Yeah, you know, I really wanted people to have the experience that I had when I was seeing these patients. Um, and so I hope that people feel a lot when they're reading the book. Oh, I felt um, quite a bit. Um, it, In fact, I, so I read, I finished the book right before I went to sleep. And my dreams last night were so weird um, I feel like they were like, like partly tied to the stories in your book and partly tied to like my mom. Like I was like, I woke up this morning. I was like, mom, I miss you. You know, like she's, she's still, <laughs> she's still alive. I was like, I want to see you every day. <laughs> and and yeah. I'm like, where did that come from? I thought I didn't like my mom. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I love my mom. I love my mom. <laughs> she's going to hear this, you know. No, I know. I know. No, I love her. I love her. But, but I, I've been trying to put my distance, uh, but uh, between me and her a little bit because she's a very overprotective Jewish mother, but, um, and still is, <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, but, um, but just reading your book, I was just like, it made me want to like, um, uh, hold on to time as much as possible. It's always something I've had an issue with anyway, is like t- the idea of time passing by um, has always, uh, I've always been neurotic about that ever since I was actually in counseling as a little kid over that because it freaked me out. But especially after reading your book now as well, it's like, it's heightened my appreciation of everyone in my life. Yeah. I think most people don't think about that until they get to a certain age. And, um, you know, so in the book, I, I follow these four very different patients and then I'm the fifth patient. And I think that woven throughout all of our stories is this question of how do we want to spend our time? Um, you know, are we being intentional about how we're spending our time or are we just squandering it away? And, um, you know, I hope that, um, you know, when you read the book that it made you, it didn't scare you, but that it made you be more aware of, you know, what am I doing with my life? It did. Absolutely. It didn't scare me. No. Um, it, it, it just made me appreciate, uh, just have more gratitude. Uh, your book, remind, you remind me kind of like a modern day or Irving Yalom <laughs> a bit. I mean, I don't think there's been anyone else uh, who's done what he's done before since you, uh, you know, like I, you know, in, in terms of, um, being a therapist and writing such compelling stories uh, about their patients and even, you know, the existential themes of your writing in particular. I don't know. Has he been an influence on your work? He has, definitely. I first read him when I was in medical school um, at Stanford, and he, of course, was at Stanford. And um, he... Um, Can you read that? Can you read it? Pleasing everyone is impossible, but pissing everyone off is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. If I had a cup, I would be drinking to that too. <laughs> um, so I, so I, you know, I, I corresponded with him a little bit and, and met with him when I was at Stanford briefly, and that was a million years ago. And mm. then I reconnected with him when I wrote this book and I was really nervous giving this book to him um, because, you know, he's such a master at bringing people into the therapy room in a way that's universal, that it doesn't feel like it's about therapy, but it feels like it's about the human condition. And um, he 
was so lovely and such a fan of the book. And, and, um, I actually was supposed to do an event with him in the Bay area when I was on book tour and he became ill and couldn't do the event. And his son, who's also a psychotherapist, Victor, um, did the event with me. And it meant so much to me to have the Yalums, you know, um, supporting this. Absolutely. And now you have Kaufman supporting it. You're, you're made. I know. But that was, that was like the, the icing on the cake when, Just, when I got Kaufman supporting it. <laughs> but um, no, I'm, I'm such a big fan of, um, of Yalm's work as well. I reached out to him a couple of years ago. I was in San Francisco. I was like, Hey, can I, can I just come over to your house and talk to you? And he's like, sure. And like, <laughs> I spent an afternoon with him and like, we talked about so much. He, it turned out he was friends with the Raul May. Yes. Um, it was one of my favorite psychotherapists and he was at Raul, he was on Raul May's deathbed. Did you and know that? Raul, yeah. yeah. Well, I did because yeah. Raul May was, was his therapist at one point. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. But he's so generous in that way, you know, to say to somebody, yeah. yeah, just come over. And, and, you know, he thinks about the world in a way that I think he tries to encourage everybody else to, which is to really consider, you know, what do you want to do with your time on this planet? Yeah. And he talks about these fundamental themes of human existence. And your book is full of those themes. And if you see enough patients, you'll just like, it's basically like doing like a subjective factor analysis, <laughs> you know, it's like not an objective factor analysis, but subjectively you start to notice like there's these groupings, like these things keep coming over, over. We, 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 we all think we're like so unique, you know, and like our problems are so, I'm the only one, you know, suffering with guilt or redemption, meaning, mortality, loneliness, love, you know, but, um, you know, you see enough patients, you, you start to see these themes over and over again again. How does that impact sort of your own life, you know, and, and, and thinking about these themes and how they play out in your own life? Yeah, it's such a such a great point, because I think that we all know that everybody else experiences um, heartbreak and grief and loss and, um, you know, great joy and, you know, all of those things. But when it happens to us, we think that ours is particularly unique, that no one has yeah. experienced it in exactly the same way. So, you know, the book opens with me going through this breakup. Um, and of course I feel like, well, you know, it's very specific to me. Um, you know, and I know intellectually that so many other people have experienced something like this, but the way that it happened, what, you know, the play by play that I keep giving my therapist, I, I really want him to understand my unique experience. Um, And what you see as a therapist is that we're all more the same than we are different. And I think that there are so many times that we feel isolated in our experiences because we don't realize how connected our experiences are to everybody else's. And I think that when, you know, the title of the book is maybe you should talk to someone. And I don't necessarily mean maybe you should talk to a therapist. I mean, maybe we need to talk to each other more because we do feel so alone in our experience. And the more that we could talk to people and really talk to people, the more we'll realize that, oh, you know, other people have experienced exactly this. We were having this conversation. I was having this conversation with my students just yesterday. Um, I had a, I have a large lecture hall and I, I just put up a, a poll and students can do it anonymously with their self with their cell phones. And I just put up the question, are you lonely? And mm. I yeah, yes or no. What I wanted to do is, is for them to all see just how lonely everyone else was in the classroom. Now I was praying that I would get a good number on the yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean just just so to make it worth the, the point. <laughs> Although if it wasn't, then that actually would be good for, for good for the students if they weren't lonely. But anyway, it came out about thirty three percent said yes. And I said, you know, like that's really telling. Like, just think on your this campus. One out of every three people that you walk past in this campus has the experience of "I am lonely," and no one's smiling at each other. No one's. I, I, you know, I tried an experiment yesterday where I tried to smile at everyone that I passed. Uh, I mean, do you try? You know, don't ever try that in New York City. You they know, think you, they, they think that something is wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. They think they that I'm ready for the mental institution. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's interesting because I think that no matter what people come in with, um, there is this kind of 
loneliness in the background, even if they're surrounded by people, even if they, you know, have families and friends and all of those things. Um, I think that we're so disconnected in so many ways um, that we don't realize how lonely we are just for the simple act of sitting face to face with another person uninterrupted like you do in therapy for 50 minutes. But people don't do that outside because they've got something pinging or dinging or vibrating or ringing and they're always distracted. And it, there's there's something so, um, you know, connecting, I think, and, and it feels so good to be able to sit with someone face to face in the same physical space, not mediated by a screen or FaceTime, um, and, and really just sit there without any interruptions. We, we have so few opportunities for that nowadays. Oh, my gosh, so few opportunities. And not just, um, I mean, we I feel like we I have the opportunities, but my I'm addicted. <laughs> like, like, like there's, there's the two issues. There's the opportunity, but then there's like, you know, I, yeah, the phone's there and I have, I have the opportunity not to, to look at it, but I got to look at it. <laughs> you yeah, know, like, you know, oh my God, I got to know what, I got to know what they said on Twitter. Did they like <laughs> my post? <laughs> One of my colleagues calls the internet the most effective short-term non-prescription painkiller out there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's so true when you talk about addiction. It's addiction is a way to numb, right? It's a way to not feel. Um, and so that's what the internet does, what our phones do for us. It's, it's, oh, I'm having a feeling. Oh, let's see what's on Twitter. Oh, I'm having a feeling. Let me just, you know, scroll through my phone. But it's just, it's so, isn't that scary to think that like, like I'm addicted, but because it's so normalized, like some certain addictions, I feel like are more normalized than others. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we're all like, yeah, whatever. Like, it's perfectly normal that we're all in the elevator together and we're all looking at our phones and, you know, like it's, yeah, it's perfectly normal. Like it's, it's, so there's certain things that, but yeah, but it's, I just want to scream at everyone. You're all addicted. <laughs> you know, like, like, just, like it's no different than being addicted to like chocolate, you know, or anything. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's not. And I think that, that people don't realize that so they feel this loneliness, and especially couples, you know, I'll, I see a lot of couples in my practice and they'll come in and they'll, they'll talk about, you know, not like feeling like something is missing, something's not there. Mm -hmm. And then when I get into their lives that, you know, you find out that like there are one person's on the iPad and the other person's watching a show and the other person's scrolling through the phone. And it's like, they really, they might be in the same room. They might be next to each other and even touching each other. Oh. But like, you know, there's, there's, there's something else there that gets between them. And that's when you realize it's an addiction where you can't let it go. Yeah, absolutely. Hi all. I'm really excited to announce that the psychology podcast is now being sponsored by better help. The world's largest counseling service. BetterHelp has asked me to talk to you about your mental health and how to reach out and get help. This is a topic really near and dear to my heart, so I definitely wanted to get this message across. After all, you wouldn't hesitate to go to the doctor for professional care if you had a broken arm. Your mental health deserves the same attention. BetterHelp's mission is to provide everyone with easy, affordable, and private access to professional counseling anytime, anywhere. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own counselor from their network of licensed, accredited, and board-certified therapists. It's really great because you can start communicating in just under 24 hours. It's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. What's really cool is that there's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network, which may not be locally available in many areas. You know, personally, I love it. I've started seeing a counselor at BetterHelp who has helped me with my intimacy issues. And I just love how non-judgmental and professional the counselor is. Some other cool things about BetterUp is that you're not limited to the 9 to 5 of traditional therapy, and you can log in to your account anytime to send a message to your counselor. You can even schedule weekly video or phone sessions and get timely and thoughtful responses from your own personal counselor. You'll never have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room ever again. It's clear that BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches as they make it easy and free to change counselors if ever needed. Also, BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So look, you can get started today. Listeners of the Psychology Podcast get 10% off their first month by going to BetterHelp forward slash psych podcast. Again, you can get started right away and enjoy 10% off your first month of high quality therapy by going to B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com forward psych podcast. That's better H-E-L-P dot com forward psych podcast. Okay, now back to the show. So just um, just talking of like at a meta level about your book, because um, I know not everyone has read it. 
I don't know if you knew that, but not everyone in the world has read it. You're uh, but kidding. It That's, seems like it's it, though. so disappointing. I don't, I don't know how to handle no, that news. It seems like it. So even my, you know, my, my new therapist that I'm just starting to see who I, uh, I had to change my appointment today because I was like, I have, the, I have a podcast chat with Lori Gottlieb first. She's like, oh my God, you have a chat with Lori Gottlieb. <laughs> she's so, she's famous. Anyway, um, I mean, everyone, I feel like everyone has, you know, it feels like everyone has read your book. I mean, people love it. Like, like now, how does this not go to your head? Like, you seem like such a grounded, you know, humility, you know, like, like for a book to become a bestseller for a writer, um, do you have any tips on how to still stay grounded? I think that's an important tip in itself to, for people to know. Well, you know, it's funny. And I talk about this in the book that I wasn't supposed to be writing this book. And so there was a long saga that led up to it. Um, You know, I had written this piece for the Atlantic called How to Land Your Kid in Therapy, Why Our Obsession with Our Kids' Happiness Might Be Dooming Them to Unhappy Adulthoods. Mm -hmm. And that piece went crazy viral. And publishers wanted me to write that book. Mm -hmm. And um, and I talk about in my book, and maybe shocked someone, I talk about how they offered me this like ridiculous amount of money, like amount of money I'd never seen on paper before with my name associated with it. And I said, no, I said, no. And everyone thought I was insane. Um, but I just felt like I was starting out as a therapist and I wanted to write something. Um, I didn't want to write a book about, you know, that I felt like there were a lot of books out there that talked about overparenting. And I felt like the world needed something else at that moment. And I didn't know what it was. And I thought, I want to write about the adults. And they're like, oh, you want to write a happiness book? And I'm like, no. Uh, But it ended up being sort of this happiness book. And so I couldn't write it. And I I like had writer's block. I, I, I didn't feel connected to the material at all. I felt it was, you know, beside the point, I feel like happiness as a byproduct of living your life in a fulfilling way, in a meaningful way is great. But happiness as a goal in and of itself is kind of a disaster. And that wasn't the book I wanted to write. So I ended up canceling that book. And I didn't think I was going to write another book. And then one day, I decided I just want to bring people into the therapy room. That's the experience that I wanted them to have. I wanted to write about the human condition. And so um, I thought like three people would write this book. This was not the the reception of, you know, like the, the parenting book. So um, when I turned in my first draft to my editor, you know, she was like, oh, we really like this. We think a lot of people are going to read it. And I thought, oh, God, I should clean myself up. I should you know, <laughs> like because I really didn't think anyone was going to read this. But I didn't clean myself up. And I think that's why so many people have read it. You know, it's been like 20 odd weeks on the New York Times list at this point. And it's it's amazing to me that so many people are reading it. But I think that the reason they're reading it is because it's so real, you know, nobody's cleaned up in there. And, and so it doesn't go to my head because I feel like this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to offer this experience to people. And it's so gratifying that so many people, they say like, you know, they're dog earing it and highlighting it and pinning up quotes. And, and I feel like that's so gratifying. It's not, it's not, um, it's not about how many people are reading the book. It's about the impact that it's having on the people who do. Mm. I love that so much. And it's such a great attitude to have uh, for a book. Um, you know, being a, a fellow psychologist and reading your book, I, it's like automatic, I can't help but analyze you, <laughs> you know, as I'm reading it. Like, is, I, people say, like, is it a switch? Can you just turn it on? And on? Like, like I can try, but it's, but I still can't fully like when I even, you know, when I go on dates, you know, people are like, Oh, are you analyzing me right now? I'm like, no, but like subconsciously. But you're I like, kinda, but tell me about your childhood. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I can't, <laughs> can't help it. I can't help it. But, um, so, uh, do you want to know some things I observed about you? <laughs> As re- reading Absolutely. It? I'm curious. So, um, so just, uh, just to start, um, I was really quite, blown away and and I would say touched by how deeply you find meaning in almost anything you know even the slightest slightest thing you're you're searching what is the meaning of this what is the what is the, what is the pattern here what you know you're, you're you're such a deep deep thinker um now now the, the trite thing would be like, well, you're trained as a psych- psychotherapist to do that, but I don't think that's quite right. I mean, I think that that's probably part of your personality as well. Um, that you in your in your in your life are just like, um, I mean, the extent to which you um, just think so many different angles about a person's life and and things has that always been part of your your characteristics? You know, I was a competitive chess player growing up. 
Mm. And I think one thing you do when you're playing chess is you think several moves ahead. Mm. And I think that that's what you do as a therapist too, is that you're thinking, okay, if I make this move, let me see what the, what the person is going to do in response to my move. Mm. And you might need to adjust, right? Um, but you're always kind of planning your moves and and then adjusting based on what the other person does with it. And I think that's that's part of what you have to do. And I think that, you know, when you talk about finding meaning in things, um, you, you know, my whole kind of nonlinear, very circuitous trajectory to becoming a therapist, mm-hmm. I write about in the book, I, I never thought I would be a therapist. Um, it never occurred to me. I, I started off working in film and then I moved over and I was a network executive at NBC and then I was working on ER and that made me want to go to medical school and then I wanted to be a journalist because I wanted to get inside people's stories in a different way. And then I became a therapist. And so, you know, I think I always just followed something that really excited me. And I feel like sometimes we're so afraid to do something that excites us because it's inconvenient or risky. And my philosophy has always been, you know, for better or worse, by the way, um, has always been, I want to follow the excitement. Take me there. Yeah. Well, that's very, that's very clear. Um, you're, but you're, you're such a, you're such a um, juxtaposition of, of, of things that, uh, you know, or you're, you're an excellent writer. Um, obviously, the story part is, is part of it. You're um, excellent sort of communicator captured, but you also have this like, kind of absurd like sense of humor like it's, you sort of you can see a sense of humor in things as well right like that's not just the meaning of things but like like humans we are so, i mean i feel like i have that too you know like like i feel like humans like we're ridiculous and and we don't realize how ridiculous we are until we like kind of see someone else do the same thing we're doing and i like like i, I think um being a psychologist especially a, a clinical psychologist having a private practice or a practice of some sort and seeing patients in a way is very healing to the psychotherapist itself and in itself of itself because you start to see oh you know like I've been really ridiculous in, in, in worrying about this myself, you know, like you kind of see it as a di- at a distance. Yeah. I mean, I, I say, you know, I talk about how we're mirrors for each other. So we're not doing therapy for ourselves when we're helping somebody else as a therapist, but you can't help but think about the things that somebody's talking about as it relates to your own life. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that our patients open us up to lots of questions that we need to explore for ourselves. And they show us what our, what our sort of areas of challenge are um, in the ways that we react to them, in the ways that we think about what they're talking about. And, you know, when you talk about sort of humans are ridiculous, um, you know, we're all ridiculous. And I think that going back to that sort of loneliness theme, that we feel so alone in our ridiculousness, but we also all have blind spots. And I think one of the things that a therapist can do for people is to hold up a mirror to them and to help them to see their reflection in a way that they haven't already seen it. And that helps them to see this pattern. You know, why do I keep doing the same thing over and over that's going to guarantee my own unhappiness? What is that pattern? What is that blind spot? Um, And once you can see those things, you can make different choices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're giving free advice to my to our listeners right now. Uh, that's very, 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 <laughs> very generous so. of you. <laughs> very, gen- so. very generous, very generous. Very generous. Um, so you said something in the book. Uh, that one of the the themes in your book that I um, just have been contemplating because I, I agree with it, but I also think there's some deeper implications. And even you may realize, or uh, as you present it in the book, you say that there's no hierarchy of pain, that suffering shouldn't be ranked. That's can right. you elaborate a little bit on that? And can we can we talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I think that's so important. Um, I feel like so many people minimize um, their whatever their emotional struggles are. So um, you know, I think like if something feels off with our bodies, like you're having chest pain, you'll probably go to the cardiologist before you're having a massive heart attack. But if something feels off emotionally, often we say things like, oh, it's really not that bad, or I'll just power through, or I have so many other things in my life, or look at all the people who are really suffering. You know, so we feel like it's on this hierarchy, and then people don't really get help until they're having the equivalent of an emotional heart attack. They're having a crisis. And why, you know, we don't do that with our health. We don't wait until we're like on our deathbed to go get help. Um, So I feel like people don't realize that you don't have to struggle so much. You don't have to suffer so much that our emotional health matters. It matters probably more than anything else in terms of the quality, not only of our lives, but the quality of the lives of the people who interact with us, our families, our friends, our coworkers. Um, 
And so, you know, I think that couples do this a lot. They compete with pain. Like, oh, I, I'm so exhausted, especially when they have kids, right? You know, I'm so exhausted and I did this and I did that. And my pain is bigger than yours. So you need to do this for me. Um, and it's not a competition. There's room for both of your struggles. And I well, think people... Yeah. Yeah. And so I think people like they compete or, you know, so that's, that's so they try to either up their pain on the hierarchy or they minimize it and they, and they don't get help. And I think those are the two things. And why do we even have to rank our pain? I don't think pain should be ranked. Pain is pain. Well, I love, I love that point. Uh, uh, but there are such deep implications of that for, um, for political issues. So um, I was wondering just how you contemplated and how you square that away with the social justice movement, um, which um, is, uh, uh, you know, as a professor at Barnard College, like I'm enmeshed in this world, you know, but there's a certain like language as well. So white privilege, you know, if you're in the privileged class, I think they do kind of rank, uh, there is kind of a hierarchy of pain. So if you're in a uh, more, if you're in a quote, oppressed group, your pain is worse than if you're in a privileged group. It, it sort of feels that way that kind of discussion it occurs. And I, and I was wondering if you've linked that at all to your idea. I think what gets lost in those conversations is that we all want to be on a human level understood. And so I think for people who have not had privilege, um, they feel like they haven't been heard. They haven't been seen. Their pain has been invisible. And so they feel like you really need to see my pain. And then what happens is for people who have had privilege and they do struggle and they do have pain, that, that it feels like you don't get to do that. You don't get to be seen or heard because you've ignored our pain and struggle for so long. And my feeling about that is that everybody's pain and struggle and experience needs to be heard and 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 needs to be worthy of being heard. That I feel like silencing anyone is just dangerous. Well, here, here, <laughs> here, here. I agree. Uh, so. I've just been thinking just so much lately about like how we can have a healthy social justice movement that is not uh, premised on on psychological principles that are not going to be conducive to growth, you know, for anyone, you know, but that kind of will uplift all groups. And um, it, it's it's just I'm just th- it's been on my mind a lot lately. So thanks for talking about that with me. Yeah, well, I'll give yeah. you a person a personal example of that, which is that in in the book, I one of the people that I see is this young woman who is in her early thirties and she had just gotten married and she comes back from her honeymoon. She discovers she has cancer. Um, ultimately she discovers she has terminal cancer. And I always wondered, you know, would I go from seeing her to someone who's like, my husband doesn't initiate sex, you know, and would I be able to kind of, you know, (laughs) give this person you know, like not minimize this person's pain in my head because I just came off of a session of this young woman in her thirties who's dying. Um, And I really, you know, it really was not a problem at all. And I realized this because I think that underneath our struggles are very similar kinds of things. Of course, I'm I'm not comparing this person who's dying to this person whose husband wouldn't initiate sex. But I think that's the point is that everybody is struggling with something and, and there's great pain in feeling rejected and feeling like the person that you love doesn't love you, um, in, in feeling unlovable. That's incredibly painful. And so I didn't need to compare it to the, the pain of this other woman. I just needed to take her pain for what it was. Yeah, that's, I, I love that. I love that you did that and that you also acknowledged that your gut reaction was one to say, look, I just saw someone who's dying, like, can you chill? <laughs> but I love that you acknowledged that you had that urge, but then you were still able to kind of override it and think about the greater humanity or the common humanity in it. Um, Wonderful. So look, why is it so hard for us to change when we really know what's good for us? Like, it's not that complicated. Like you, your broccoli, you know, you have your broccoli or you got your pizza. Is it the rocket science that you like, if you choose the broccoli, you'll be healthier. You know, we get it, you know, but we, I choose the pizza all, almost all the time. So what, what, what's wrong with us? You know, it's interesting because change, even really positive change, like a job promotion, um, or, you know, moving to a new city that's going to be, have more opportunities for you or getting married to the person you love, um, or having a baby and you really wanted a baby. All of those changes, um, involve loss. 
And so I think we, we forget about that, that, that we have to give up the thing that we've been holding on to for so long, even if the thing we were holding on to was miserable. You know, it's why people mm. stay in bad relationships for so long, um, because, you know, even if the relationship is making you miserable, at least it's familiar. You know what it is. It's home. And if you leave and you go somewhere new, there's the uncertainty of what's that going to be like? You know exactly what it's going to be like in your current relationship. You know what the arguments are going to be about. You know what the eye roll is going to look like. You know, you know, you know what the pain is going to be like. But if you go into this new experience, you don't know what it's going to be like yet. What if it's what if it's worse? Um, Mm. You know, what if what I do, humans don't do well with uncertainty? No. And when we change, especially we have neurotic. To face, yeah, <laughs> we have to we have to face uncertainty. Right. Um, yeah. And and I think also that, you know, there are lots of times when something is good for us, like you give the broccoli and the pizza example, um, something is good for us. And yet part of us doesn't want to be good to ourselves. And we don't realize that. No, there, you know, there's, for people who have had trauma, there's almost like you're so uncomfortable with the, the healthy decision that like you're averse to it. We, mm -hmm. Right. If there's something that feels almost wrong about, and it's not conscious, like you're not thinking this, it's not in your awareness. Um, but sometimes doing good things for yourself, it feels you, you sabotage yourself because you don't feel deep down that you deserve to do that. And, and you don't know how to handle it. Like, what would it even feel like to be kind to myself? Mm -hmm. There was one there was one patient I had who, you know, and so many of us, trauma or not, are so unkind to ourselves that just what we say, like, you're such an idiot or you look terrible or, you know, that will never work out for you. You know, whatever it is. Um, I had somebody write down everything she said, you know, kind of in her head um, and bring it back the next session. And she came back and she said, I can't read this to you. I am such a bully to myself. Like I'm embarrassed to read this to you. And she realized, you know, all of the things that she would say to herself, she would never say to a friend in the mm -hmm. same situation. You would never, you wouldn't have any friends if you said that. So I think we don't realize how unkind we can be to ourselves. And that's part of why we don't make positive changes for ourselves because we don't, we don't let ourselves be happy. Hey everyone. I'm pleased to announce a new sponsor of the show, Prolific. Prolific is a high-quality research service that helps researchers find participants for their studies on demand. Prolific has a pool of 75,000 active participants in North America and Europe. My colleagues and I have had great experiences using Prolific. In fact, we've used it for the past couple of years in studying our light versus dark triad um, test. And we found it really easy to select the types of participants we wanted to include, and we we're really impressed by how high quality the data turned out to be. It was clear that the participants took our study very seriously, which is also something really great in comparison to some of the alternatives out there, such as Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Um, actually, there's quite a few reasons why Prolific is better than uh, the alternatives. For one, Prolific is the only platform that lets you collect samples that are nationally representative of the U.S. or U.K. at the click of a button. This is a real game changer because it makes representative sampling more accessible to research labs around the world and also because it makes psychology research more generalizable. Also, Prolific distributes studies evenly across participants, so there's less of a problem with professional survey takers. They even monitor their data and any feedback that they get from researchers and participants, they take seriously um, and they do this to make sure that they catch any bad actors. I also really like that their survey takers are regular citizens and you can quickly recruit a wide range of demographics such as Democrats and Republicans, African Americans, young people, old people, students, etc. all on demand. Third, Prolific makes it really easy to run longitudinal or follow-up studies. It's typically very difficult to run a study that tracks participants over time, but since the prolific participants are so diligent, they have a really low attrition rate. In fact, on average, 86% of the prolific participants take part in follow-up studies. That's really quite awesome. So all in all, it's very clear that the good folks at Prolific care hugely about data quality. And I'm excited to announce that we have a great deal today just for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get $50 in free prolific credit by going to www.prolific.co forward slash the psychology podcast. So go to that website to redeem $50 off. Only the first 100 researchers will get this freebie. And there are no strings attached other than setting up a 15-minute demo call with them so they can explain how the platform works. Again, for $50 in free prolific credit, Go to www.prolific.co forward slash the psychology podcast. That's www.prolific.co forward slash the psychology podcast. 
Okay, now back to the show. Um, a lot of people in the self-compassion uh, movement treat they 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 did kind of define self-compassion as treating yourself like you would treat a good friend. But I have a spin on that. Do you want to hear my spin? Yeah. Because people can be can be cruel to us. So, for instance, like if you you might have grown up with a parent, and your parent might have said you're a loser, you're you're horrible. So I think self-compassion is allowing yourself to treat yourself kinder than other people treat you, <laughs> you know, like as well. Like there's another about, aspect of it. Yeah. I don't think it's about treating, treating yourself the way other people might treat you because that's out of your control. I think what's in your control is how you treat other people. So I would say self-compassion is about treating yourself the way you treat other people that you care about. But what if you're an asshole and you just don't treat anyone well? Well, I think that's part of what therapy helps you do is it helps you to, to have a better relationship with yourself so that you can have a re- better relationship with other people. Um, you know, I always say mm-hmm. that, that insight is the booby prize of therapy, that mm-hmm. you can have all the insight in the world, but if you don't actually make changes out in the world, the insight is useless. So if you say, yeah, I know that I, you know, I treat people a certain way and now I know why it was because this happened in my history. It doesn't matter that you know that if you still go out and you're an asshole. Right. Mm. So so it's about what are you going to do now that you have that information? How are you going to make those behavioral changes? And they're small changes. They, they're they very small because it's those small steps that add up to really large change over time. And, and so I think that people think they need to, like, change overnight. No, you won't be able to do that. You will fail. So I don't want to set people up for failure. I want them to make one small change. When you're about to say that thing that you say, mm-hmm. I want you to take 10 deep breaths. That's the only thing I want you to do. You might still say that the horrible thing, but take 10 deep breaths and see what that is like. Just have some time between stimulus and response and see what happens, right? And then the next time they might not say the thing. And another time they might do something else. And it's about these graduated steps to changing behavior until it becomes automatic, until they relearn and they're literally rewiring their brains to do something different. And that neural pathway that used to just do the asholic thing, and I just made up that word asholic, but to do that asholic thing that they normally do, right? Um, That gets rewired and they won't automatically do that anymore. Well, I do love that point very much. I um, I want to just... uh, elaborate on, on on what I was trying to say as well, and, and see if you see any any wisdom in it at all. Because it seems like people, it does it, it like doesn't dawn on, on certain people that they don't have to treat themselves as harshly as an abuser has treated them. Like like you don't have to believe the words of someone else. You know, like you know, like it, it's very easy. You know, to, when you get in kind of abusive relationship or whatever, to start like believing I am scum or I am a loser. You know, but be like, you know what? You're not like that's that's not true. You know, like yeah. So anyway, that's that's the, well, that's, yeah. I think that that's you know, there's this woman in the book Rita, who's her hmm. adult children won't talk to her because you know she she grew up with with a very kind of. Um, lonely, lonely, neglectful Mm. childhood. And, um, and, you know, then she picked guys, you know, she picked husbands who would not, who would not treat her well. But when she found somebody good, she couldn't, she couldn't rejoice in that. She was always hypervigilant. It's like PTSD, right? Like there's a word cherophobia, which is, which is fear Mm. of joy. Chero is joy. So fear of joy. And she had that, like, you know, the minute she felt joy, a piano was going to fall from the sky. You know, something something bad was going to happen. She would be punished for her joy. So for her, mm. joy wasn't pleasure. Joy was anticipatory pain. Yeah. And I think that for people who have a history of trauma, that they don't know what to do with joy. It feels anxiety provoking. It feels scary. They can't trust it. Yeah, I think that's so exactly it's easier right. to beat up on themselves. It's easier to just keep that monologue in their heads about like, you know, what a, what a horrible person they are because that's familiar and that's home. So is the process of therapy for you a process of kind of cha- do you, do you try to rewire change those pathways that that make it feel familiar and you 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 have like like pave new pathways that that are healthier that feel familiar? Yeah, I think that you know the 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 relationship that happens in therapy is so important. It's it's very different from mm-hmm. going to like 
um, a dentist who's going to give you, you know, fill your cavity. And it's, it's very specific about what's going to happen. It doesn't matter how much you like your dentist. It's nice, but you know, you can't talk anyway because someone's in your mouth. So, you know, mm-hmm. but when you're, but when you're doing therapy, um, you know, study after study shows that the most important factor in the success of your therapy isn't the person's training or the modality they're using or the number of years of experience. It's the relationship. All of those other things matter. Don't get me wrong. They do matter, but they don't matter as much as the relationship does. And so when you could go and have a relationship with somebody and be vulnerable and be authentic and show the truth of who you are, and you get a very different response than you got from whomever in your history, um, that's life-changing. And then you can translate that and, and, and bring that out into the world. Absolutely. That, that's why I love, uh, you know, the Carl Rogers approach. I'm I'm such a geek for humanistic psychology. Like we got to bring it back. <laughs> but I think a lot of therapists, you know, do bring a lot of his, you know, this this client-centered humanistic approach to their work because I you know, I think gone are the days of the brick wall therapist, the one who just yeah. kind of sits back yeah. and says, "Uh-huh." Yes. Um, you know, we're doing a um the the TV, the uh the book is being made into a TV show. Um mm-hmm. and um one of the things that's really important to me is that we don't kind of that therapy therapy and therapists I think have been portrayed in these ways that are so cliched and so outmoded. You know, there's either like the brick wall therapist that I was just talking mm-hmm. about, or there's the the one that you saw in in treatment, you know, the hot mess, the train wreck, the the therapist who, you know, is is a mess in his or her personal life. And and those don't neither of those reflects what therapists are really like or what therapy is really like. I mean, we're just normal people like everybody else. And and I think that, you know, I say at the beginning of the book that my greatest credential is that I'm a card carrying member of the human race, mm. that, that that allows me to help you because I know what it's like to be a person in the world. I love that. And I, I imagine it also, it, yeah, it makes people feel good to kind of know that your therapist is a bit of a mess as well. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's also a certain sense of something there, schadenfreude or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's bad about being a mess. I think it's about the fact that life is messy. And I think it's about the fact that, you know, nobody gets through life without struggling, no matter what it looks mm. like on social media. Right. Yeah. So, you know, no matter what it looks like, um, we all struggle. If you are human, you struggle, whether you acknowledge the struggle or you don't acknowledge the struggle, how you move through the struggle, how you navigate through the world, that's going to be different, but everybody struggles. Well, speak for yourself. No, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, okay. So what makes for a boring patient? So many people are worried about boring their therapists. Um, you know, I, I think that what makes people boring are the people who won't let you in. They're the people who, you know, I, I, let me let me step back for a second. I think that when most people come to therapy for the first time, there's almost a performative aspect to it, meaning that they want the therapist to like them. They want the therapist to respect them. And they want the therapist to think that, you know, I think they're, they have a lot of shame around the fact that they're struggling. And so they want to seem a little bit more together maybe than they really are. Um, and I think that that gets boring after a while because what happens is um, you don't really get to see them. And I think what makes people, what draws people to other people is their humanity. What draws people to other people is their authenticity, is being genuine. Um, and people who kind of put up a wall, like I'm going to perform for you, I'm going to entertain you, or I'm not going to really let you see me. Um, we're just going to stay up here on the surface. That gets boring. And so it's, it's ironic because I think the thing that people are trying to do to get you to like them is actually causing me not to like them. Yeah, <laughs> that is so true. Well, should we, should we both reveal something to each other that's deeply personal <laughs> to I overcome think I was, this? <laughs> I think I was so personal in the book that oh. I, I... <laughs> you were not personal enough for a lifetime. Yeah. 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 No, no, you really were. I mean, yeah, like, like, like. I, I, for lack of a better term, like mad props to you, you know, like for, um, for putting so much of that out there. Like I, I've put my own personal story out there as well with, in being in special ed as a kid. And it's like, you think it's going to be this horror, terrifying thing. And then you do find it actually is the thing that, that people like about you. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean that, 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 that gave you, I think so much more credibility, yeah. right. To, to be able to say, and here's my story. Yeah. And I think that ultimately that's what we all want is to say, you know, 
this is my story. Here's who I am. And, and can you, can you see me? Can you understand me? Um, you know, so I let it rip in the book. Um, (laughs) you sure do. Um, do. (laughs) I sure did. Um, and you know, and I, and I think that, that I wanted people to see that you can be a, a very capable, competent clinician and, you know, or it doesn't even have to be a therapist. Like you can be a really capable, competent person in the world and also struggle. And they're both true. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find videos of many of these conversations. Just search for The Psychology Podcast on YouTube. Third, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read all the reviews, and they're helpful to others who are thinking about giving the show a listen. Finally, if you really want to show some love, you can donate something to the show. Even just the price of a cup of coffee would really help me continue to do this podcast for you all. To donate something, you can go to thepsychologypodcast.com and click on the link at the bottom that says Become a Sponsor. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity, and I really appreciate you joining me on this journey. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah. There's this, um, you just made me think, like like uh, Abraham Maslow said that one of the characteristics of self-actualizing people was dichotomy transcendence. And it seems like a lot of work in, 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 in psychotherapy is like helping patients transcend these kind of like rigid dichotomies they have that either they're an evil person or they're a good person or either they're, you know, or the world is either this or that. And, uh, and that was another, another thing that you just, another dichotomy you just transcended just now. Well, I'll tell you that when people come in, I would say a lot of people come in and they say they want to change, but what they really want is they want someone else to change because that other person, they can't hold Mm. the dichotomy that they have a role in what's going on in this relationship, right? Whether Mm. it's with their child, whether it's with their partner, whether it's with their parents or, you know, sibling, whatever it is, Um, they can't hold the fact that the other person has a role in it, but so do they. And um, I see that in couples a lot too. this dichotomy of here's the story. I have the true version, right? My partner has some other version that really has a lot of gaps in it. But the fact is, like, just because you see the same story from different perspectives doesn't mean that one or the other isn't true. They're both true from that person's perspective. Yeah. Um, Let me let me let me let me process what you just said there, because um. Uh, so th- isn't there, is there a scientific generalizable objective truth though, as well, that, that lies kind of above both of them? I think there's a, a truth in terms of facts, right? Like, right, right. Um, you were late, you weren't late, right? Um, you know, right. Um, yeah, yeah. those kinds of things. Um, but I think people try to argue with each other's feelings. They try to say, how can you be angry about that? Or how can you be upset I about see. that? Yeah. Or no, you know, you, you, you thought this, you know, it's like, no, you can't really argue with somebody else's feelings. You can, you can, you know, you can argue, you, you can disagree with what they want, why they're disappointed in you. You can, you can mm-hmm. disagree with that, but to try to convince them not to feel disappointment is, is you're arguing with something they feel and you can't change that. You can talk about the relationship differently. Um, so I think, you know, when you talk about, is there like a, a, an objective truth, um, mm. there are, there are sort of facts and then there are feelings and you can't really argue with the feelings. You can work with the feelings. You can do well, something with the feelings. Well, Ben Shapiro says my facts don't care about your feelings, <laughs> but anyway. That's true. That yeah. is absolutely true. That's right. But also feel, sometimes feelings don't care about the facts. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You don't hear that reverse too much. You don't hear oh, that part. It is it is a staple of couples therapy because, sure, because sure. and I'll tell you there's like a, a gender difference there too, to be, you know, very, you know, to generalize um 
that sometimes if it's a heterosexual couple, the man in the couple will very much try to argue with the facts, right? Or, 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 or he will, he will, he will try to like stick to like the facts and yeah. the female partner is like arguing with the facts and he gets like infuriated by this. And so, you know, you have to kind of reframe. I always say to people who come to couples therapy before they even step foot in the office, I say, what I want you to do before you come in is I want you to think about your goals for yourself. I don't want you to think about what you want the partner to do. I don't want you to think about anything that you want the partner to change. I want you to think about what you want to change to make this a better relationship. And if they're always focused in that way, they're not going to start arguing so much about the facts and the feelings and this and that, because they're going to focus on you are responsible for your feelings and your facts, not the other person's. Hmm. I love that. Like that, that, that element of responsibility seems to be a big, a big part of, uh, of, of the therapeutic process. Um, yeah. Did, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, no, it, it is. I mean, I think that's, that's such a theme in the book is that yeah. we need to take responsibility for our own lives. And it's so much easier. And I, you know, I say this from personal experience in the book and in life that, um, it's so much easier to blame somebody else. It's so much easier to blame another person or our circumstances or the world or the culture or whatever it is. And I'm not saying that those, that those aren't valid, um, stressors in our lives. Mm. But also we have choices about how we respond to them. We have, yeah, the, the Viktor Frankl. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you sound like you're a good therapist. <laughs> I just got to say. Thank you. <laughs> you sound like you're a good therapist. Um, I kind of want therapy from you. Uh, no. Um, so do you have a lot of clients right now? So, you know, it's funny because I was really, a lot of people said to me, what do you think will happen to your practice when you reveal so much about yourself so publicly mm. in this book. And I, I, I had a full practice before the book came out. Mm. So my hope wasn't that I would get more patients, but my hope was that people wouldn't leave in droves. <laughs> oh, know, like, wow. Really? Okay. Right. Um, and it was really interesting um, because the the response, you know, I, I didn't tell people that I had a book coming out, um, mm -hmm. but I did say I'm going to be away for this amount of time. And I didn't say why. And it was the most amount of, I took I took four weeks off, which I've never done. I don't even think I've ever taken more than one week off. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, nobody asked. I said, I'm going to be away for, you know, these dates. And when I came back, some people came in and they sat on my couch and they said, so. I read your book, right? And and yeah. we had such really rich, deep conversations, not about me, but about them and about their experience and about our relationship as, you know, and what it meant to them and, and what was working for them and what was not working for them. And, um, you know, just, it gave them permission to kind of open up that conversation about the two of us, um, which I think is really important to have in, in any therapeutic relationship. And then there were other people who to this day, you know, um, have not said a word. And, and I, I find it, you know, I don't know whether they just don't know about the book, but I find that a little bit questionable. I think if they are coming to me, they probably know that I've written this book at this point um, and they haven't brought it up. So um, so there's, there's both sides of that. But if they read your book, wouldn't they know that, um, how cathartic it is to reveal that you like know something about someone and you didn't like you were with Wendell and, uh, you're like, you, you say, you make it clear. It was so cathartic, like admitting right. that, you know, <laughs> you know, his yeah, past. I, I, I Google stalked yeah. my therapist one night and then I was editing myself in the therapy room and then finally yeah. I came clean and yeah. Um, you know, but I still think that, um, there's a, you know, how people interact in the therapy room is a microcosm of how people interact out in the world. And for people who may be more avoidant or people who mm. um, don't know how to bring something up, you know, they're going to do the same thing in the therapy room. So it's, it's, it, I think it depends on that person's characterological makeup in terms of how they respond to the fact that their therapist has put so much personal information out there about herself. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I would, I was, I was predicting that you would just get so many more patient, like people wanting to work with you after reading your book. Yeah, no, I'm actually uh, expanding my practice. Um, cool. Because, you know, I think there are a lot of people who 
really want to come see someone. And I think the book has inspired a lot of people to come see someone. So, um, you know, I either refer people to other people or I'm trying to expand my practice to um, bring in more therapists to my practice to accommodate people who want to come because I, I don't want to turn people away. That's what, that's great. Um, well, so I wanted to ask you, is there a common myth about therapy that you'd like to dispel? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> I know, I know. I, <laughs> right? no, I, I, I asked that, like, but obviously there's so many. I would say, I would say the main one that I think people have is that you come to therapy you're going, I think people are afraid to come to therapy for this reason, that they think if they come to therapy, they're going to talk about their childhood ad nauseum and they're never going to leave. Mm -hmm. That that's sort of like the stereotype of therapy is that all you do is talk about your painful childhood and you're never going to leave and you're going to come back every week and, you know, just download the story of the week and that's therapy. That's not at all what therapy is. And in fact, therapy, of course, we talk about how your past informs the present, but we're very much focused on the present and the future. And I think that people don't realize that at all. It sounds counterintuitive to them. They think it's about sort of working through your past. And what, what I think most therapists nowadays do is they want to say, how is something that you're carrying around, like clothing that no longer fits, how are you, how, are, how is wearing that clothing impacting the way you present yourself in the world? And so we really focus on how, what they're doing now is, is maybe not serving them. It maybe served them when they were younger, but now it doesn't serve them anymore. And then also thinking about how the present informs the future. So what you do now informs what your future is going to look like. So we really want to be mindful of what you're doing now because it will affect the different directions that your future can go. And I think people don't realize that that's what we're talking about in therapy. Yeah. And the other thing I think people don't realize is that we very much are aware of if someone comes in and they're not really working or they're not, or they're just sort of, you know, talking about the, the anecdote of the week. Um, I want to know, are they done or are they not talking about what they really need to be talking about? But I don't want to keep them there if I'm wasting their time. You, you're so perceptive, like you're so perceptive, but yeah, you're like a chess player too, though. Like, it's not just that you're perceptive. You, you're, you're, you like automatically are constantly thinking of, yeah, like you said earlier, like the next step down the line, or what is the meaning here? What um, do you do? You ever just like let go and, and just like not think? Like, can you shut it off ever? Oh, all the time. Okay. I mean, I think I think that that's why, as a therapist, and I know so many therapists feel this way, that you know, you limit the number of people you can see in a row, for example, mm -hmm. because more than I think so many jobs, maybe being a surgeon, you have to have this kind of focus, of course, right? But I think like in, when I'm doing my writing, for example, I don't have this kind of focus at all because mm -hmm. I can be like, oh, I'm hungry. Let me go in the other room or let me think about these three emails I need to return <laughs> or, you know, whatever it is. You can't do that when you're doing therapy with someone. You're, it's, it, you're hyper-focused on what's going on in the room, on every aspect of what's going on in the room, whether it's body language or energy in the room or a look or a facial expression or a pause. Um, you're really focused on, you know, I always say I'm listening for the music under the lyrics, that the mm -hmm. lyrics are what they're talking about. But I'm also focused on the music. What is, what is the underlying sort of struggle or pattern or what's the, what, what else are they communicating to me that's not through their words? And so you have to be really, really focused to do that. And so we can't see that many people in a row without a break. Mm. Whereas when I'm writing, my God, my mind is, you know, in five different directions. Absolutely. And I also, it, it occurred to me, I mean, how not just your thinking, but it would ring the book, just how deeply you feel things and how much empathy you have for your patients comes through so clearly in your book. And, you know, a real thing in, the, in this profession is empathy burnout or uh, compassion fatigue or what people call it different things. Um, do you, do you, uh, do you ever feel empathy burnout? I think I'm very careful to protect myself from it. And, mm. and if I feel that I'm, you know, veering in that direction, I think mm. that, you know, all therapists, I think you, I have a consultation group. I think a lot of people do consultation groups where we talk about our cases every week with other therapists, but we also talk about if we're feeling burned out um, and what do we do and how do we practice self-care and what do we need to do to make sure that every person who comes to us is getting, you know, the best version of us. 
Um, but of course, there are times when, you know, I've had a session and I leave that session and I think that was not my finest hour, <laughs> um, uh, you know, because I'm yeah. human. Um, but then For the next sure. week, I and then I say, OK, now what do I need to focus on with this person next week? Because I wasn't as present as I needed to be. I love that. Wait, I'm gonna. Can I adapt that in my own personal life? The the phrase. You know what? That wasn't my finest hour. Like <laughs> like I was giving a lecture yesterday to my students, and I was like, I told my TAs afterwards. I was like, I felt like a dork today. Like I just felt like I'm. I felt old. Like I was making jokes about like social media and stuff, but I didn't like. I wasn't up on things, and I felt like I just felt like such a dork. But then I was like, you know what? Whatever. That just wasn't my finest. Like like now that's gonna be my new catchphrase. I can. I love it. You, yeah, you can have it. I don't even know where it's from, but <laughs> but I but I feel like well, I don't want to like, like own it, but I'm just saying, you know, it you just seems so helpful. It. Borrow can, it, borrow. It just seems so helpful. Share it, yeah. share it. How about share it? Yeah. But I think we need that. That goes back to sort of the self compassion. Is you don't beat yourself up when that happens. You say, you know what? I didn't get enough sleep last night, or my father's in the hospital, or you know, whatever yeah. it is, and that's what happened. Um, and so then you you address it the next time. I love that. By the way, um, I could see you being a really good lawyer as well. Like, I, I feel like... I um, would hate being a lawyer. No, I and I, I, I feel like you would hate it too, but I think you'd actually be a really, like, a really quite special lawyer because I could actually, I see this certain element in you where you, like you really are kind of averse to bullshit. Like there, there's, there's another side of you that I, that's very clear to me that like you're almost, and you're also a very good bullshit detector. I, I get the sense, you know, that like, it like, it like automatically, like, like you're like, no, <laughs> like that, that is not yeah, true. I'm not the yeah. earth mother therapist. Right, 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 right. right? right. No, no, I'm you're not, not. you're not, not. you're I'm not. Very much, you know, I'm yeah. very much like I want to, you know, I always said I want to hold people yeah. accountable. So I feel like when you come to therapy, you need to be vulnerable and accountable and, and if I'm not holding you accountable, then I'm not doing you a service in here. Yeah. And that's what makes you a terrific therapist as well. By the way, you know, you understand, I'm not saying like you should have been, I'm saying I could see you do, you know, but I, I have this like image of you um, with like uh, someone on the witness stand and you're like cross-examining them and they just like crack immediately under it with, with you because <laughs> well, you like, yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. No. I, so, you know, I was a journalist. I still am a journalist. So, you know, I, after all those years of journalism where part of what you're doing is you're getting inside a story, right? And you yeah, and you really yeah. want to find the story. And it's not, well, I was going to say it's not manipulative, but it is manipulative, but not in a negative way. So you're, you're actually trying to help somebody to open up to you. Yeah. Um, and, and because that's the interesting story and they don't realize that's the interesting story. Yeah. And I think that that's what you do as a therapist is you try to help people to get to the interesting part of the story, the part that matters. And, and I think that, you know, when you're a lawyer, you're trying to do the same thing, which is, except you have an ulterior motive, but you're trying to get them to talk about this part of the story. Yeah. And so, you know, and I, and I think it's, you know, how do you get people to, to talk to you about what you want them to to open up about. But I, I think, you know, the, the goal and the motive of the lawyer is very different from the goal and the motive of the therapist. Oh, yeah. And that's why, that's precisely why you wouldn't enjoy it because right. of the motive behind it. But I still think you'd be good at it. <laughs> you know, like, right. like, like I think within four seconds, uh, four minutes, the, you know, the, even the person who did the worst crimes, like, no, I didn't do it all. You, but you would like, you would get beneath the surface somehow. And they'd be like, okay, I admit it, Lori. <laughs> you <know? laughs> well, you know what you do in therapy is a lot of times you call people on their contradictions. So somebody will say, yeah, I, um, you know, I, I wish that I could stop this affair, right? Mm -hmm. I wish I could stop this affair. And on the other hand, they keep doing it, you know? So it's like, I love, I love my partner and I, I know I'm tearing up my family doing this, but I, I wish I could stop. Um, and so, you know, what are the contradictions? What are the two? So you, you get like each of those pieces of that person to, to say out loud their piece and they can argue with each other. And mm -hmm. it's so interesting to hear that we all have these, these parts of ourselves. So we go back to going back to the dichotomy that there's a part of us that wants something. And there's a part of us that gets in the way of the thing that we want. <laughs> And how story those, of my life, <laughs> right? And how do you get those two parts of yourself to talk to each other? And once they can talk to each other, that's when something moves forward. It's so true. I and I had a lot of insights reading your book, and one is you know personal insights, and one was just clearly the fact that, um, like I get in my own way. Like I would be so much better off in so many ways 
if I just didn't do things as opposed to if I did something more, if that made any sense. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 Sometimes we like think that we need to do something right. in cases where not doing something is the better decision. Yeah. Like with like, you know, like on dates and stuff, I think sometimes, you know, I would have been so much smoother if I just didn't say those 40 things I said, you know, and that's it. Just, just it change nothing else, but just eradicate those 40 things. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that's anxiety. Usually we, we take action when we take sort of extraneous action or action that sabotages ourselves. We do it because out of anxiety a lot of the time. <laughs> Well, that's something I struggled with my whole life. But, um, you know, finally, lastly, I do want to point out that you have a column. You write, I mean, you do a lot. You do, you're a busy person. Um, so you write uh, this Dear Therapist column, which I love. Thank you. Um, I, I love this advice you gave uh, to this woman once. And you just like, I mean, you were such a, some, the thing I like about you, by the way, is that you are such a sharpshooter. Like I tend to gravitate towards those kinds of people in any way. Um, probably uh, just like, it's just a value of mine as well. So, um, and, and you find that by being that, that, that level of honesty with like, you know, ca- calling people on their contradictions, as you put it, um, people respond to that um, positively um, because they know that you're doing it from a place of wanting to help them. Right. And I think it's a relief to be called on your contradictions Yeah. because I think that when you have these two parts of yourself that are fighting with each other, it creates a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress. Um, and it takes a lot of emotional real estate to do that. You know, yeah. it's like takes up so much emotional real estate, even if it's sort of under the surface. Um, and I think once they, once you give those contradictions some air, um, you know, it's like you can breathe easier too. They need air. Our feelings need air. We always say that, you know, I think so many people f- come into therapy and they're like, help me not to feel, help me not to feel so anxious, help me not to feel so sad, help me not to feel whatever it is. And it's like, if you, if you suppress one feeling, you suppress the others. And what happens is the, the way that they suppress them is they go into a state of numbness and mm. numbness isn't nothingness. Numbness isn't, a, isn't like a lack of feelings. Numbness is a, is a state of being overwhelmed by too many feelings. And so when you are numb, you're just, you're, you're like on overload and you just shut down and you can't function in that state. So I think in my call of what I try to do with people is I try to say, listen, I, I try to hold up that mirror and I try to say, here's what you're telling me in your letter. And if you came to me as a therapist, here's what I might not say in that very first session, but here's what I would be thinking. Mm -hmm. And I just lay it all out there for them. (laughs) And I think, and I think that that's really helpful. You know, it's, and it's not so much like, no, don't talk to your mother-in-law. You know, it's not that it's, I want you to see your own role in this. And I want you to see the choices that you have. I want you to see your agency and pretty much every letter, every answer that I write is about, here's what you're not seeing in terms of your agency and what is under your control and what you can do. Well, I want to end on that note because um, it's it's so empowering um, and it's um, it's also so human. So thank you so much, Lori, for um, all the work you've done and for writing such a terrific, terrific book that gives a, a window, a, an insight into the life, the real life experience of a wonderful therapist such as yourself. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to do this. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion below. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. Thanks for being such a great supporter of this podcast and be sure to tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.